Good morning, good morning, my dear friends. As we gather for worship this morning, let's ask the Lord to open the eyes of our hearts so that we might truly see Him this morning in worship. today. As I look out there and I see all them smiling faces, it either could be that uh, that we are here to worship God, or maybe somebody heard that we were feeding you today. And if that's the case, then you heard wrong. Sorry, we got no food. Uh, <laughs> but we truly are glad to be here in the presence of the Lord this morning to lift up our voices and to praise His mighty name. I'd like to invite you this morning to join me opening up your bulletin in our responsive call to worship. God, we come to you broken, battered, and bruised by sin. Your grace is sufficient for us. God, we struggle with self-doubt and bitterness. Your grace is sufficient for us. God, we refuse to believe that we are worthy of your love. Your grace is sufficient for us. God, help us to believe and to accept you today. Your grace is sufficient for us. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Dear friends, the path to understanding and accepting God's love is to acknowledge our need for prayer. Let us join our voices this morning as we sing our opening hymn, It's Me, It's Me, O Lord. have a seat. Dear friends, as we seek to understand the Lord, we find Him in His Holy Word. I'd like to invite you to hear our first scripture reading today. More than just hear it, if you've got your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, please join me in the 21st chapter of the book of Matthew starting in the 23rd verse, where we hear these words. 
Jesus entered the temple courts. And when, while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for all they all held that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. My dear friends, this is the word of God this morning for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. When we hear God's word, our hearts sing with praise and our lips respond to them. Join me this morning for our responsive Psalter reading found inside your bulletin. And hopefully it's a lot shorter than last week's. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. The Lord is our God, whose judgments are all in all the earth. The covenant made with Abraham. His promise sworn to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of the Lord, as your portion for inheritance. Amen and amen.
before we go to God's Word, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Most wonderful and gracious Heavenly Father, once again, what a blessing it is to be led by the hand, by the Holy Spirit, to be here in your presence this morning, knowing that regardless of who we are, what we have done, what we have left undone, what our perceived faults are, the sins that we carry around with us, Lord, that you are bigger than, it, than all of that. And you still reach out your hand in love to us. God, it is easy to think that you are a vengeful God, that you condemn those who do not find your favor. But God, the reality and the truth is that you are a loving God. It is not your will for us to die in our sins, but it is your will that we would live in your righteousness. And so this morning as we hear your word, we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and to touch our hearts. Lord, to open our eyes to the fact that you love us. Regardless of what we have done, you have extended an olive branch of peace through the blood of Jesus Christ to atone for the sins of your children. All we have to do is to reach out and to accept that gift of grace and mercy. And God, we just ask that you empowered us to do that today. We pray all this in the mighty name this morning of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If God is so loving, so gracious, and so good, why would he ever condemn anyone to the fiery pits of hell? Dear friends, that is a question that as a pastor I have often heard both from unbelievers as well as frustrated believers, heartbroken believers. But here's the deal. The answer to that question doesn't lie with God. The answer to that question lies with us. I want you to, this morning to hear the Word of God. It comes to us from the book of Ezekiel, 18th chapter, beginning in the first verse, where we hear these words this morning. Ezekiel writes, The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel, for everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear, you Israelites, is my way unjust? Isn't it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sins, they will die for it because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is right and just, they will save their life. Because they consider all the offenses they have committed and turn away from them, that person will surely live. They will not die. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. 
Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. My friends, this is the Word of God this morning for us, the people of God. Thank Thanks you. be to God. This is the fourth week that we have been exploring a, a series entitled, Love Your Enemies. We started off with looking at what love looks like through due process. The fact that when somebody does wrong, often the most loving thing we can do for them, whether they are friend or foe, is to let them suffer the consequences of their actions. My friends, we talked about how this can be hard, especially with our children. When we see them stumbling and falling, we want to reach out and catch them, but sometimes the loving thing that we do is to let them fall and let them suffer just a little bit. We talked the next week about when God transforms evil into good, about how God does not cause evil things to happen, but sometimes he will let evil things happen and then turn that into something great and glorious. And then last week we talked about mercy and God's higher calling. You remember how we talked about the story of Jonah when, when he was called to go to the Ninevites, his sworn mortal enemy, and to preach God's repentance. And he refused to go because he knew that they were going to repent and he knew God was a good God and he knew God would forgive them. And sure enough, when he went and preached the word of God to the Ninevites, they repented, God relented, and Jonah pounded like, pouted like a little kid. He couldn't understand that God's mercy extended to all and God had a higher calling. The common thread in the last three weeks has been we have been talking about enemies and foes outside. This week, we're going to learn to love the enemy within ourselves. I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Now, when we look at the text from Ezekiel today, one thing that, that, that's important to remember is this text covers a time period that is almost 3,000 years in the past. So it would be a mistake for us to truly think that we understand and have a grasp on what's going on. But what has happened is Ezekiel is a man who is, he's an Israelite. He has been taken captive by the Babylonians. You see, the Israelites had fallen short of what they were supposed to be as the people of God. And God had allowed the Babylonians to come in and to enslave the Israelites and haul them off into exile. Ezekiel was one of the men in exile and God came to him in the middle of that and he says, Ezekiel, I've got a job for you. And so his call as a prophet came when he was imprisoned in a land not his own. Israel is in exile not because God is an evil God, not because God's ways are unjust, but Israel is in exile because of what Israel has done and failed to do. But just like most people I know, they don't want to take responsibility for their own faults. So who do they turn to? They turn to the same being that most of us turn to when things go wrong in our lives. It's got to be your fault, God. It surely couldn't be my fault. You're the one who is unfair, God. Now, I hate to make too close of a comparison between God and earthly being, but how many parents have heard those same exact words from your children when you hold them accountable for something that they have done? That's not fair. You're not being just. And the Israelites were no different. So they argue that God is unfair in punishing them. Even though God gave them ample warning that if they didn't turn from their idolatrous ways, if they didn't turn from their sinful ways, that these things would happen. They refuse to acknowledge the enemy within themselves. My dear friends, as we look at how the Israelites handled this situation, when they had an opportunity to choose path A, which is God's path, or path B, which is their own path, it is only natural that we would look at our own lives, our own selves, and say, how does this apply to us today? 
So if you're looking at your life today, you really have two scenarios. You've got scenario number one. We'll talk about that one. Scenario one is to keep on living any which way you want to live. And you will die in your sins, guilty as God, as God charges you for that. So how often in our own lives do we sound like the rebellious Israelites? How often do we stomp our feet and say, you know what, God, I don't like the way you ask me to do things. I want to do things my own way. And when you punish me for that, God, that's not fair. You should be a little more loving. In fact, the whole New Testament talks about how loving and merciful and gracious you are. Here's the problem with Christianity today. We have taken that portrait of God and we have extended it to say God should accept anything that we as mortal humans say is okay. Anything. No matter what we want to do with our lives, if we're happy with it, God's got to be happy with it. There is a great danger in living our lives that way because make no mistake about it, God is loving, God is merciful, but God is just and God is righteous. And if we continue to live our lives in sin, I promise you we will die in our guilt. So that's scenario one. That's one way that we can choose to live our lives. How about scenario number two? Maybe we give it a shot trying it God's way. How about if, as Ezekiel says, we live in a new spirit and a new heart? I want you to hear the key word that Ezekiel uses, and it is mirrored in in the four Gospels, in the accounts of Jesus' baptism, actually John's baptism, John the Baptist, as he was baptizing people, preparing the way, what was the key word that, they, that John the Baptist used and Ezekiel used? He, they say, repent. They don't say, keep doing what you're doing. It's a good thing. He says, repent. But here's the problem. Most of us don't know what the word repent means. We think the word repent means to feel sorry for. I made a mistake. I ran over one of Charlie's dogs as I was going to his house the other day, and I repented of that. I'm sorry, Charlie. I ran over your dog. Here's the deal. That's not what repent means at all. The word repent means to turn around. Turn 180 degrees. If you're going this direction in your life, to repent means to turn around and go that direction. If God says your life is being lived in sin and iniquity, to repent means to turn and to live in justice and in righteousness. I read an article just earlier this week by the president of Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. For those of you who never heard of it, I'm just going to tell you, it is one of the finest theological schools in our country. And he quoted a survey by which about 10 years ago, evangelical Protestants were asked the question, how many of you believe in the Latin term sola fide? Now, most folks don't even know what that means. It was one of the five great pillars that came out of the Protestant Reformation, and it means faith alone. Here's the, uh, a quick backdrop on it. Back before the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the Catholic Church said you had to work your way into heaven. Sola fide means faith alone, not by works, lest any man boast. That's scriptural. Paul says that. But only by the faith of Jesus Christ are you saved and go to heaven. So about 93% of all evangelicals 10 years ago believed that it was only by faith alone that you get to heaven. They did the same survey not long ago, and it's down to 84% of evangelicals say maybe sola fide is not exactly all there is to it. That's a huge decrease in something that we have considered a central tenet of Christianity for some 600 years. Here's the thing. Are we truly only saved 
by faith alone. I know a lot of Christians say, yep, that's it. All I got to do is profess in Jesus Christ is Lord. Walk the Romans road of salvation. Go through the ABCs. Stamp my ticket to heaven. And then I put it on cruise control and I'm good from there. The problem is, is they forget to read the second chapter of the book of James. Where he says, so you believe in God. Good. Even the demons believe in God and they shudder. What James is saying is even the devil himself believes in God because he used to work for God before he was cast out of heaven into the earthly realms. So believing in God maybe is not the only thing that there is, the only box to check. Maybe we have to somehow be changed by that belief. Now we Methodists should know a lot about that. I talk a lot about the three main facets of grace as we understand as Westerns, prevenient grace, the grace that works in our lives before we even know that we need God. We talk about the justifying grace, which is the grace that God gives us the moment that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But Methodists believe that it does not stop there, that we have to move on in sanctification. We have to let God's sanctifying grace pour over us and that sanctifying grace gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Now, you know what happens when you allow God to give you a new heart and a new spirit? Your life will look radically different. Now, here's the thing. This is not new stuff coming from your pastor. I've been preaching this for going on a year and a half now. That if you are truly saved, your life will look like you're truly saved. So that's scenario number two. Number one is to die in your sins. Scenario number two is to live in your new spirit and new heart that God gives you. So now what we have done is we have come to grips with the enemy within us. That we are sinful people. That we are prone to wander away from God. And then we ask him to install within us a new spirit. So let me say this real clear in case you're not getting it from the, 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 the preaching this morning. God is not the enemy here. The Israelites accused him of it. We sometimes accuse him of it, but God's not the enemy. We're the enemy. You see, God has never desired our death. If God truly desired the death of wicked people, we would have never got past Adam and Eve in the garden. God took pity upon Adam and Eve even after they rebelled against him. You remember what he did? He didn't strike them dead right where they stood. He killed a couple of animals, made clothes for them, gave them provisions, and then cast them out of the garden. And then immediately started on a plan to bring all of humanity right back into that garden one day. He has never desired that we die in sin, but rather that we live with a new spirit and a new heart in righteousness. And here's another thing. We're not responsible for anybody but ourselves. We tend to worry about what's going on around us, and God's like, I'm not gonna punish you, Pastor Richard, for Earl's sin. And Earl, you're not going to be punished for Miss Gloria's sin. God will only hold us accountable for what we do and we don't do. So that means we don't have to come to grips with anybody else. We don't have to worry about the enemies that are outside. We have to come to grips with who we are and what we are. And at some point, we have to come to love the enemy within us. So here's a question that has been burning on my heart all week as I contemplated standing before you today. What does a new heart and a new spirit look like? It's easy to say it looks like somebody that lives their life different. Perhaps it looks like knowing who we are and asking God for his justifying grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. Perhaps... It looks like laying down the guilt and the shame that keeps us 
from accepting God's love and God's mercy. Perhaps it is simply facing our darkest fears and seeing that they're not that bad when viewed in the bright light of day. Here is the good gospel news for you. This is the good gospel news that should give us great hope as we get ready to wrap up this morning's worship service. That God does not want our punishment, but he wants us to have a new heart and a new life in him. We're going to make mistakes, and he knows that. But when we accept the forgiveness that he offers in the blood of Christ, we live freely in the grace of God. And my friends, that is good news this morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've got a couple of announcements this morning. I'll start with, uh, with North United Methodist Church. We had, uh, for those of you that weren't there at the administrative council meeting, we had a council meeting on Thursday night to discuss charge conference matters as well as to uh, kind of test the waters and see where we were about re resuming in-person indoor worship. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I believe right, it was a unanimous vote, was it not? Uh, North has voted unanimously to uh, resume indoor worship, and we're setting a target date for October 11th. That's two weeks from today, so we'll have one more outdoor worship here, and then we will transition back into the building. Now, that doesn't mean that things are going to go back the way they were just because we're in the building the way we were. Um, we're going to have some precautions. We've got some folks that are working on that right now to, to make sure we can do it as safe as we possibly can, but that we're still authentic in the way we worship God. So just stay tuned for more, uh, more information to come from there. Um, also, before I move on to Ebenezer, um, I've got, uh, I just want to let you know that Billy Robinson, Billy, is anybody going with you tomorrow? We're not from, uh, not from here. Okay. We've got 14 people going to Alabama, Mobile area, and we've got the you know, Hurricane South have one team in this past week. They worked on three churches and six homes. We're going back to one of those churches and kind of focusing on those churches at this time. Okay. So you're leaving Mo Mobile Air, the Gulf Coast of Alabama. Okay, so so Billy is going to be uh, going with that team, and um, and I don't know if we normally do this. I like to commission a missionary before we send them out, and normally I'd have you come up and we'd lay hands on you, Billy, but given the current climate we're in, we, we will lay hands on you from here, and I just want to commission you for the work that God has given you. So let us, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know from reading your word that you have commissioned your people to go and to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone we meet. And Lord, we also know from your servant, St. Francis of Assisi, that we are called to preach the gospel day in and day out and to, when necessary, use our words. So we are to infer from that that we are used to use our hands and feet to show people the love of Jesus Christ. And so we now, in that spirit this morning, commission your servant, Billy Robinson, for the task that you have given him. May, be, may he be your hands and feet in the Gulf Coast of Alabama as he goes down there to provide some much-needed relief, but also to show your love for your people. Lord, go with him with the power of the Holy Spirit that hearts and minds might be changed through his actions. We give you thanks for his willingness to serve you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we all pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right, two things for uh, Ebenezer. Uh, I hope everybody got the message uh, we are having uh, an administrative council meeting here right after church, 11 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and meet since we're already here. North has uh, graciously allowed us to use their facilities. We're going to meet in the fellowship hall. Uh, we also at Ebenezer are going to be handling charge conference matters as well as uh, voting to see where you guys are about resuming in uh, indoor worship. So uh, 
Um, if you're from Ebenezer, please stick around for a uh, short council meeting right after church. Last but not least, unless I'm missing something, um, you see this beautiful basket of flowers that are here on the uh, altar table. Once again, this is a generous gift from Mr. Sidney Livingston at St. John United Methodist, and he has once again tasked me with the uh, enviable uh, job of finding a, a, a worthy recipient of this beautiful basket of flowers. Um, last time we had a gift, it went to the person who uh, had the youngest child here. And if you've ever tried to go to church with young children, you know what a struggle that can be. Well, today we're going on the other end of the spectrum. And sometimes as, as we get a little bit older, it is hard to get to church, especially when we have been struggling with health issues. And, and I saw somebody, she was the first person that I saw here other than the, uh, the, the worship team. Um, and she's faithful when she can be. And we're so glad uh, that, that she is able and, and willing to continue to make it out to worship every Sunday that she can. Miss Margaret Gallagher, this is your beautiful basket of flowers and you don't have to do anything. We will get somebody to bring it to you as soon as worship is over. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, are there any other announcements in any of the three churches for the good of the congregation this morning? Anything I might have missed? Billy? Thank you so much, Billy. What you got there, Mr. Pearson? <laughs> Pearson wants you all to know that him and his daddy killed a deer. <laughs> all right. You're going to save some for me, right? Don't kill them all. All right, brothers and sisters, as we, when we humble ourselves and call out to God, he hears and he answers us. Let us join our voices this morning as we close out this sweet hour of worship, singing our closing hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Let's do
it's easy to look at those around us and those that are not like us and those who oppose us and to see enemies everywhere we look. It's harder to look within ourselves and see the enemies within us. It's even harder to lay that down and accept the grace and mercy that Jesus Christ offers us. But that is the good news that I want you to treasure up today, that when we do that, when we confront and learn to love the enemy within, God's grace is right there for the taking. Reach out and take it this week. I bid you to go forth in peace. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Hey folks, remember to click the subscribe button below and ring the bell to be notified when we post new content. And as always, if today's video touched you in some way, please hit the thumbs up button and leave us a comment. We love to hear how our content impacts your walk with Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless.